Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio. I'm your host, Deborah Bailey. And when I started this show in 2008, I was on a mission to promote women-owned businesses and help women succeed by providing resources and valuable tips from other women and men, small business owners. In each interview, my guests speak openly about their triumphs, the scary times, and tough decisions they had to make along the way. Women Entrepreneurs Radio is about showing women how to harness their natural strengths to achieve success on their own terms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. I'm really glad you could join me today. And if you're listening to this on Panamatic, you can also find this show on iTunes. You can subscribe there. And also it's on iHeartRadio, Spotify, um, YouTube. There is different platforms where you can find the show. So you can find out more about that if you go to womenentrepreneursecrets.com and you go and uh, click on podcast in the menu bar. And you will see some of the platforms that are listed, if there's different ones that you'd rather uh, listen to the show. If you are, however, listening on iTunes and you're using an iPhone or iPad or something, um, you can just scroll down and leave a review. That would be much appreciated. Any uh, reviews like that help the show to be found by more listeners on iTunes, because, of course, the algorithms help. If there are more people leaving reviews, then the more people will be able to see the show. So that would be great if you could take a moment to do that. And also, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to dbailycoach.com and find out about my coaching and some online courses I've created and also uh, some of my books. You can also find out more about uh, some of my fiction at brightstreetbooks.com. So I hope that you'll stop by there as well. So right now, I'm going to introduce my guest for today, and it's Diane Allen, and she's a jeweler, art collector, entrepreneur, and advisor who is involved in Desert X and helping many emerging artists with their careers. Diane Allen Presents is driven by curating and cultivating emerging artists. Not only is Diane a renewed creative entrepreneur, art collector, and jeweler, but also innovator, philanthropist, and a true Renaissance woman. Being told by a teacher she wouldn't be able to survive in the art world, Diane's passion grew when she started her jewelry business in 1981. Besides, she collected art throughout her life, even owning an early Andy Warhol. So welcome to the show, Diane. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be on your show, Debbie. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm I'm really happy to hear more about what you've been doing, and this sounds really fascinating and and all the work that you're doing but we want to start out just a little bit and usually what I'll ask my guests is how you got started and what you're doing I'd love to hear that yeah well how I got here and you touched on base basically was my parents were artists and tennis teachers which is funny but mm-hmm. I grew up in around art and art art collecting and parents who painted and I landed in art school with several teachers that had this very negative attitude about being an artist and making a living. And I felt very um, motivated to make money at an, a young age. I was the little girl that did, um, you know, lemonade stands and things. So long after, not long after that, a psychic in school that I met through a class told me I should be in a three-dimensional art form. And within a short amount of time after dropping out of college, I found myself as a jewel, working in a jewelry store and had a hundred light bulbs go on saying, this is your three-dimensional art form. Duh. And I loved it. And I quickly learned all the details of jewelry and opened up stores. And I was a jeweler primarily for 38 years of my life, only recently closing my two stores in Los Angeles, which did quite well. It was really, it was a fun career. Mm -hmm. So backing up a little bit though, I discovered collecting art as a byproduct of not being in school. I, in San Francisco, I went to UCLA and started taking extension classes. And one of them was with Mumsy Nemiroff, who was very well known and took all of her students to Venice early on to meet all the emerging artists in Venice and the new art galleries and people like Laddie John Dill and Judy Stabil. And we went to their studios and that just created a passion about collecting art and seeing art all the time. 
that was a long intro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, because that, that's really um, interesting to see how you were led to what you're doing and how that has evolved. But since yeah. you've been collecting art, and that's something that people are very interested in. What, what are some of the things that you share with people who ask you about how they get started? Yeah, well, for me, I think um, it, it started uh, because of, of merging myself in the, the studio visit world where you meet artists who are um, not well known oftentimes, who um, there's such a different relationship with meeting the artists and seeing them work and seeing their space and then wanting to buy them. And at that mm -hmm. point, I was buying at a price point, too, that I could afford. I think that's really important. It doesn't matter what price you start at. You buy what you like. It's really fun to meet the artist. If you don't meet the artist, that's fine, too. It's just about putting in your personal space what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And as you develop your eye, I think you make better choices. And, of course, I had an art school background, so maybe that helped me a little bit. But that doesn't mean that I'm in it for every piece to be a um, – uh, something that that will will I will profit from because I really have no intention of selling what I have, even though I have early Andy Warhols and I have um, some great uh, even older pieces that that I was expo I was exposed to very young. So it, it's aesthetics, it's um, the relationship to the artist, and and most definitely it's just buying what you can afford that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very interesting because I I guess maybe like a lot of people might have thought that it was a totally different thing that you'd have to consider certain different things you'd yeah. have to think about yeah well for me that was just the path that was, i was put on and it made perfect sense and my collection's very broad mm -hmm. and early on i i for instance after andy warhol died the very first um, auction was in los angeles and it was not super well attended and i decided to go with a friend and never should have put my hand up to buy a $2,500 print. But for an original Andy Warhol print, it was a fairly large edition. It's called After the Party. It's pretty wonderful. But I was able to buy that for $2,500 by just being brave enough to put my hand up. And it's probably one of my favorite pieces in my collection. So um, sometimes it's also just being a little brazen. Um, mm. But also just knowing what you love. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, and that's hard. A lot of people say, well, how do I know? I don't know what I like. I think you have to go and look at a lot of art and you mm. might be really surprised. You know, some people have ideas what what beautiful art is and it's there's no conti no no continuum. It's it's amazing how how broad broadly reaching the, the focus is in art. So when you talk about if people are saying, well, they want to collect art for investment, it sounds like that is a totally different mindset or is it really if you if you want to create well i've been i've been learning over the last let's say 15 years especially as i've been more focused on it lately that there kind of is an art form to buying art to profit and that can be done by being um in a tight network of people who know the people who are printing things for people like ed Ruscha or printing things for um uh Hinder Wiley. And if you have an opportunity to buy in that very first group at a discount, mm -hmm. you might get the privilege of seeing that that piece is doubled in value within a shorter amount of time. But for me, that's, that's one of the last things on my mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a fun benefit of being, for instance, on the Desert X board. Um, we funded Tavera Strachan to do a wonderful exhibit um, three years ago for us in, in the desert and part of the deal to help raise money again for him to be able to do this project. Um, a sculpture was offered to us, a neon sculpture, which I just love. And I was able to buy that at a really um, competitive price compared to what it is now in the galleries. And mm -hmm. again, that was to support him to support the arts. So that feels really good because you, he wouldn't have been able to finish the project if he hadn't sold 30 of these specific pieces. And they're um, from his Carnegie, Carnegie Hall exhibit, which was really interesting, where he decorated the facade of the Carnegie Museum with the neon names of contemporary um, writers and musicians and people of color. And previously, none of that existed. Mm -hmm. So he's a pretty, pretty um, creative and, and amazing artist that I love. So 
-hmm. that would be one example where I would say, yes, do, you know, if you can get into something like that and make some money, but I don't want to sell mine. <laughs> That's my problem. I'm so attached to what I have. My collection's really large, but um, I, I really don't want to sell anything, at least not at this point. Is your, would your advice in general be for, for people to hold on to their art for a certain amount of time? For those people who are thinking, well, I'd like to sell at some point, is, is there any kind of rule around that or does it just depend? I think everybody, it's kind of a little bit like gambling to me. I think some people have a really good hunch. Mm -hmm. I have a few pr friends who target early in on somebody and buy a few things in the $15,000. I'm just going to throw it numbers, fifteen mm -hmm. or 30000 And for them, if they see that it's doubled, they're out. They're not mm -hmm. attached the way I am. They may have loved it. They may love the artist, but everybody has a different attachment to things. And I also, though, don't want to have the kind of, house where I have stacks and stacks of paintings in the basement that aren't seen. Mm -hmm. And I have a nice large enough home to have a nice collection that shows. But I'll, at that point, I may sell some because I love having new. Mm -hmm. But right now, my, my, my thought process is more that I love to stay with the artist from very early on through their career and see where they go. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the exciting part. So when, when you're encountering these newer artists, or is it a matter of you seeing them like on the scene in terms of, you know, when you're out and about, is, is that how you find out about them or are there different ways well, that, that you connect? Well, it's a great question. That leads me into what I've been working on and spending the last six months on is an event called Art Versus Cancer mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And it's a maturity event for phase one. We raise money for clinical trials for cancer research. So because the whole concept I had was let's get emerging artists to donate, let's invite them to the event, let's invite people on a really inexpensive ticket to have an evening where they're exposed to art, doesn't matter if they know a lot or a little, as everything is $300 to $3,000, and um, food and music and, and interactions are involved with, with body painters. And anyway, it's a very fun night. This is only the second annual on November 13th. Mm -hmm. um, but just to give you an idea, I have probably done 30 studio visits in the last two weeks um, in order to vet some of the artists. Mm -hmm. Some of them I already knew because I do so many artist studio uh, visits. And then the other part came from our board of directors, which has helped support me by sending their own young artists and, and uh, artists that they support. So it's put me kind of front and center in front of that world. And um, also living in Los Angeles, it's booming here. I mean, mm -hmm. the downtown LA art scene is huge. Really every square inch of the city, Venice, Culver City, um, it's, it's great. Why do you think that, that LA has this huge amount of artists has it always been that way or or is that something that's been growing over time it's been growing over time but when I talk about it with other artists especially those who have moved to Los Angeles they say um, real estate in San Francisco um, has destroyed the possibility for an emerging artist to rent studio space mm. New York is a very similar story in Los Angeles yes prices are going up but there are because of the renaissance in downtown LA, but there's still, there's still space and plenty of space. And that's brought a lot of artists to Los Angeles, a lot of new galleries. And so the energy that comes with that is just infectious mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, and spreading quickly. It's fun. Say there's, there's some buildings you can go into downtown and almost every single, um, what looks like from the outside an office is this huge studio inside with this wonderful person. And artists are really fun and open. And in most cases, so come on in and, let me show you what I'm doing. And I might go on for a, a studio visit for one artist and come home having seen five. But wow. It's, yeah, it's, it's fun. I, that's what I love. So how can I complain, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, that just what you were saying just reminds me a lot of um, uh, Jersey City, where, where I used to live. And there were a lot of warehouses in time of a lot of the industrial cities. They kind of change and, and the manufacturing goes away. And it started out with a lot of artists. And then as real estate developers discovered it, they were priced out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's still happening. There's still people I'm talking to in downtown who've only been there for four years who are having to move on because now their building is close to um, Soho's new Soho warehouse. And that's pushing the art district price up. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Downtown LA is sprawling 
and what once looked horrible in six months, there's amazing restaurants and, you know, new things coming in Chinatown, everything. It's, mm-hmm. it's really crazy. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty exciting. So could you share a little bit more about Desert X and what yeah. that's about? Yeah. Well, I'm so happy. I mean, lucky and also privileged to have met Susan Davis, who is the founder, creator of Desert X. Very early on at one of her first um, founding member meetings, meaning she found something like 50 people who could put in $500 and had an event. And it was at in Coachella, and I was invited um, at the Coachella Fairgrounds um, where the art was still up after the um, big event and mm-hmm. the artists were present. And she gave a speech and said what her dream was of putting this art event biannually together for free for the public in the Coachella Valley, meaning it would be Palm Springs and maybe even out as far as Bombay Beach, which is what we did last year. Mm -hmm. Um, She was able to get Neville Wakefield, who is a a premier uh, curator, very, very well known and um, has done an excellent job. And we did our first year. It's kind of like a giant treasure hunt, if you can imagine where you go to the Ace Hotel or you go online and you find out the coordinates or the directions to a piece of art that may be enclosed within a mall, an abandoned mall, or it may be in the middle of the desert, like we did with Richard Prince, or it may be out way out in the north part of, of the hot springs where you would find, um, you know, a, a wonderful beehive that you climbed around in and so they're interactive, they're mirrored, like Doug Aiken's giant house that was Instagrammed, I think, a million times or something. So it's extremely experiential. We, we run it over several months. Um, and this coming one, our third one in 2021, will also be in conjunction with some other very big news about Desert X, which is that we're doing a kind of, not a co-partner, but having a relationship with Saudi Arabia in terms of the Saudis want to send some of their artists to Desert X, and we want to send some of our American artists to Saudi, to Alula, to a new art park they're opening, and do kind of a very cultural, very experimental exchange of art and open up a new dialogue for Mm -hmm. Desert X and the rest of the world. So we're all very excited about it. Wow, sounds like it's something that's really growing quite quite quickly. Yeah, and this whole thing was just released in the LA Times in the last couple of weeks. It's very new news, Mm -hmm. and it follows on on the footsteps of some other interesting news coming out of Saudi. So, yes, we know it's controversial, but we're all about the dialogue of and the conversation of art, Mm -hmm. and that's what, for us, comes first Mm -hmm. And uh, as a a group. And, uh, yeah, I think it's really exciting. I think it's good for everybody. So Mm -hmm. I may be going to – Saudi Arabia in January. We'll see. <laughs> right, right. Well, something with art is, is so powerful and, and certainly something, yeah. yeah, that can connect people all, all over the world. So I guess it, it really does make sense to see what you can do to open doors. Yeah. Well, I, I'm mm-hmm. glad that you agree because it is about just opening doors and there are many other countries participating. And yeah, I think it's going to mm-hmm. be very, very exciting. And in the wow. meantime, we're working, yeah, we're working on the next Desert X with, with, uh, those artists that haven't yet been named, but we have a, a big meeting coming up shortly, which I'm excited about. So mm-hmm. I'll mm-hmm. be re- I'll be able to report further after March. I mean, after March, <laughs> where are we? <laughs> wow, we're in November. After, right. After November. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it sounds as though with what you're doing, the work you're doing, that there's a lot as an entrepreneur that's also tied in with philanthropy what are your thoughts on on how the entrepreneur can really really beef up their philanthropy or really use that to help others yeah i think for me um i've always been involved in in philanthropy but my husband died really quickly from pancreatic cancer six years ago Mm -hmm. and that really lit fire under me immediately to do something and i was friends with the valmers who started phase one um, based in Los Angeles. Anyway, and I thought the idea of clinical trials and something when you're in that last ditch, horrible place with any disease, it, it's so needed. So that really got me going. Um, it led me to, like I said, the art versus cancer, which I spearhead now. But I've been on the board the last six years and have done quite a lot of fundraising 
um, for cancer research, including working with um, other hospitals um, directly and indirectly. So it, it's it's a passion, and mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a few others, but they're they're not as extensive. But you know, helping children read, and I have so many friends who do amazing things with USC, and um, you know, it's. Yeah, I think it's just a lifestyle. They seem to go together. Mm -hmm. You know, the arts mm -hmm. and philanthropy really, really do. They're both kind of very big creative spaces in which to live. Mm -hmm. And much more fun than the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I mean that sarcastic, but not really. I, I kind of often <laughs> accuse of getting all of my news and all of my life filtered through the world of art. And it's a, a, it's a better world. <laughs> mm. Well, and, and definitely the way it sounds as though what you're doing is, is also helping uh, the emerging artists to be found. And, you know, it, it sounds as though that's really kind of tough for the emerging artists to, to really get out there. Is, has that really, yeah. is that really the case? Yeah, it's, it's so difficult. It, there's so many artists and so many capable. It's almost like a game of roulette, but I started Diane Allen Presents with the notion that if I could find emerging artists that I really believed in, and since I've been in this game for so long, and I, and if I was willing to throw some money behind getting them into a group show or helping them to get their art displayed at, um, you know, a, a new hotel, anything where they can start to be seen, that I could perhaps create some kind of a contractual agreement that's very different than when a artist is lucky enough to get into a gallery where typically, and again, I'm not against the galleries. They mm -hmm. know me. I love them. It's, it's mutual. But they require a large sum percentage to mm -hmm. support their galleries and support the artists. So I'm trying something a little bit different, but with the goal that any artist that is really, really good and will get noticed will eventually align with a gallery. So until that time that they're still emerging, that's where I come in. And there's quite a, quite a few Diane Allens out there that do what I do, which is buy a piece of art so somebody can pay their rent or mm -hmm. uh, try to find a, a venue that is doing a group show that will give them a chance to um, show six or eight or ten of their paintings and start to get some momentum. Mm -hmm. And by the way, of course, Instagram is also huge right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a, an incredible source for emerging artists because there was no other way to really show um, exactly what you're doing with, with very little expense. Mm -hmm. You can't rely on it totally, but it's a stepping stone. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a, a great point um, as far as, as social media, because it seems as though without that, it's, you know, I guess that the artist would have to, try to get into a gallery? Is that normally what they would have to try to do or just try to get someone's attention to see what they're doing? Yeah. And it's a catch-22. How do you get their attention when you can't, You have to say, I've never had a show before. Right. And I've never had, you know, my body of work studied or, and, you know, and sometimes there are miracle stories where there's somebody who's just amazing and they've been hiding their work away for years and slowly developing. But generally speaking, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, it's a process, but mm -hmm. yeah, but many, many, many breakthrough. I don't want to leave any artists who hear this discouraged because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a great, it's a great life and it's, um, it's slow, it's a slow build, but it's very rewarding. And mm -hmm. I, and I know all over the world, so many artists now who have gone through exactly what I'm talking about. And in the last three to five years, they're just exploding and it's really exciting mm -hmm. getting into museums and yeah. So it, it's, it's amazing. So, Daya, could you please share with everyone where they can find out more about you and your work? Yeah, thank you. Well, mostly right now I just use two platforms. I have a website, which is Diane Allen Presents, um, and I also use Instagram, Diane Allen Presents, and Instagram, Diane Allen 23. Um, Diane Allen 23 is more my personal, but it's just hilarious because I'm not shy about showing how crazy my life is. It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> anyway. And I'm happy to have anybody check in. And um, and yes, I, and then of course I'm also trying to um, expand, you know, Desert X, and expand um, the Art versus Cancer as well. So mm -hmm. and and Art versus Cancer, you can find the information on my website at Diane Allen Presents or the Insta Diane Allen Presents. 
Wonderful. So Thank you, as, as far as the things that you were doing when you were uh, a jeweler and, and creating, is that anything that you would see yourself going back to at some point or you very, you have a full plate right now? Well, you know, I have a full plate right now. And I, I, as I said, I was a jeweler for 38 years and 23rd mm -hmm. Street Jeweler. It was a big success and I loved it. But I just had a phase in my life now where I'm loving the freedom of not going to an office every day mm. and creating a new space for myself. So, I, yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's perfect for me right now. But the store was amazing mm -hmm. and I will always be a jewelry junkie. I just love it. <laughs> Yes, it, jewelry, jewelry is fun, and there's so many different types, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's it, it bites. It's kind of a world of its its own when you look at the vintage pieces or you look at the costume pieces. I mean, there's I think there's something for everyone. So, um, oh, it's it's amazing. And I was literally like the mom and pop jeweler in Santa Monica and Manhattan Beach, where people came came in to have their family diamond reset, and mm -hmm. I can't even tell you this thousands of people that I engaged and how many things I did and I love it and people were so upset they thought they were mad at me when I closed and I said <laughs> I, need, I need I need another life I need another chapter so, here oh I am <laughs> well I'm sure you must have heard a lot of different stories and things because jewelry is, is definitely a, a can be a very yeah, personal that, thing yeah. yeah it's amazing and by the way, my, my uh, grandparents are also from Los Angeles, as are my parents. So I'm mm -hmm. third generation here. And I was just going to say that my grandfather, who was an American Indian who was raised on the reservation, ended mm -hmm. up in Beverly Hills directing silent films. Isn't this crazy? For six, he made 60 silent films. Wow. And then my parents were in Beverly Hills with zero interest in the film industry or, having, or, or how fancy you know, their, their parents were. Mm -hmm. And then I come along the next generation and all I want to do is, you know, all the art collecting and all the fancy and the velvet sofas. And it's kind of like everything, <laughs> everything skips a generation, you know, but um, yeah, but he, he's kind of my spirit animal, my grandfather, because, he, you know, film is an art form. Yes. Right. So every, every person in my family on down has been in the arts and we're all, we're all very, you know, very proud and very attached. That's fantastic. And I, I, in seeing how that has been a part of your life uh, for so long, it sounds as though that gives you a, a really a special affinity for art and really appreciating it and understanding, um, you know, what's important in making those connections with artists. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And it, like it, so it's so deeply, deeply ingrained in my blood, in my, my mind, my soul. And, um, I really understand it. And I understand it too, because I needed to support myself very early on through some things that happened. And mm -hmm. I just sure that I could do it by drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. I kind of, sorry that I gave up on myself, but maybe that's why I support young emerging artists because I feel so strongly about my own experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm so fortunate that I did fall into jewelry in a three-dimensional art form and that was amazing that was exactly how it was supposed to be mm -hmm. but here, here i am back supporting emerging artists and i don't think there's any coincidence no it, it just doesn't. feels <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't it just feels perfect <laughs> i'm sure there's not at all because it just seems like now i'm, I'm guess looking back it may look like more of a straight line now than it may have looked at the time <laughs> exactly yeah definitely <laughs> you know so Very Wow, this this is really incredible, and I, I think that the person who's listening, who may be interested in investing, I mean, do, is it a thing where they may feel like I don't know if I have the money, or I don't know if I could do this? Because you know, I guess there's an idea out here that if you're collecting art, you're at a certain level, and you can't, if you just appreciate and love it, like you're saying, that. It seems sometimes maybe people may feel they're closed out of that because, as you said, they may feel like, well, I don't understand. I don't know. What would you well, say to that well, person? I, can, I, I, I will because I tell you what I specifically do. I mm -hmm. don't do the I don't do the Venice Biennale. I don't buy art in the fifty and hundred thousand dollar, two million dollar price range. Mm -hmm. But I have had so much fun and so many great experiences doing things like small art fairs. There's one mm -hmm. called the Other Art Fair. Some of these um, artists rent the booth with their own money. They buy $500 space 
and they sell 10 paintings. And I have met a couple of amazing artists that just didn't, haven't been recognized yet, but I'm working with somebody named Amanda Flowers. And um, uh, God, there's, there's quite a few, but the point is that I bought something from her for $150. <laughs> and I know how much it meant to her, but the point is, is it's beautiful. And she has um, an incredible talent and it was a very raw piece of art. And you have to, again, have, have a very broad range of what you consider good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm measuring what is good with a lifetime experience of having painted. And I know knowing what, what that looks like to me, but there, there's a lot of inexpensive, wonderful things and including photography. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many, many, many people doing photography at, at very, very low level um, price points. Mm -hmm. And Los Angeles, even as large as it is, we have shows that have only emerging artists, very reasonably priced. Um, again, all the way up to, you know, Freeze, which was fantastic this year, the Freeze um, art show. Um, at, but there you could see $3 million, $5 million art work by Keith Herring that was also equally amazing. So mm -hmm. why not go look at the really fine things? Maybe you can't have them. Maybe I can't have them. But it doesn't mean I don't want to go and look and learn and figure out what is it about this artist that's so compelling? Mm -hmm. Or why would somebody even begin to imagine spending that kind of money? Mm -hmm. These are all the kinds of questions that I ask myself when I look all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and then I ask the price. <laughs> <laughs> You know, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> well, that happened last week. I literally was oh, looking really? at Keith Haring, and I, and I'm looking at a Keith Haring, and I love it, and I love his work, and I went up to the gallerist, and I said, just out of curiosity, how much is that? And he said, six million, if he'll sell it. <laughs> you know, and I was like, hey, perfect. <laughs> but, but again, that's not, that's not my game, and I'm not saying I'm not fortunate enough to have collected a wonderful amount uh, and a broad collection. Um, of photography and art and collage and sculpture, but um, not at that level. Well, it's good for you to explain that just so people know uh, that it is accessible to, to everyone, really. It really is. And by the mm -hmm. way, just going to, um, if you're not even going to buy art, but if you take your family or a friend and you go to the Broad one day downtown or you go to the local um, museum, no matter where you are listening from, it's such an extraordinary day it takes you out of your head it takes you to another place mm -hmm. and um, I highly recommend um, attending the art shows and galleries and museums in your in your area it, it also trains your eye to a certain degree mm -hmm. like the more that you're looking at things and, and really get yeah. more of appreciation absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely definitely yeah I think that's great because in that way people don't feel like this is something that they can't possibly participate in or, or feel intimidated by. I think it's great that it really doesn't have to be that way at all. Yeah. And one thing I was going to say too, back to the art versus cancer um, I'm doing, there were so many people um, last year, we had half the number of people coming that came up to me and said, I just bought my first piece of art. And mm. like I said, maybe it was $150 or it was $1,500. We're not trying to break the bank here. We're really trying to introduce new new younger members to phase one and to the importance of raising money for clinical trials, but also using art in that way is so exciting because people are having the experience you're describing. Mm -hmm. How do I get involved? How do I get started? Mm -hmm. And by having that first piece and going home and proudly putting it in your apartment or you know, your your room, it's it's very thrilling and it's mm -hmm. um an extension of who we are. It's a very personal uh personal decision and fun. Yes, and that, that's the thing I think it's great for people to realize. It can be something that is fun and um, they don't have to worry about if they're doing it perfectly or <laughs> but if anybody else loves it or gets it. You know what right. I mean? That's some of the funniest things. I love seeing what other people buy and I love showing them my house. Sometimes I think they might think I'm crazy. I have <laughs> quite a wide variety of things. It's not a madhouse by any means. It's, I believe in it. a, a fairly well edited look to a certain degree because my mm -hmm. house isn't a museum. It's my home. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very exciting. I think a lot of people who listen to this, if they just trust themselves to buy that one small little piece and know it's helping somebody pay the rent and 
and, mm-hmm. and that you'll take it home and love it and look at it 30 years from now and say, my God, I remember the day I bought that and how much mm-hmm. it meant to me. And yeah. And that's the beginning of the beginning of being a collector. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I, I love yeah. that idea. Uh, I really do. I think that's something that if anybody could really identify with. Um, who, yeah, you know, like, so. yeah, who loves loves just to have some art, something um, that they can really use to decorate or just to appreciate. That that is just fantastic. Um, so, um, Diane, this has really been a wonderful conversation. I, I've learned Thank a you. lot. I've loved it. <laughs> Good. Thank I've you. Learned Thank a you lot. Yes. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you for having me. Diane Allen Presents literally came out of the idea of what do I want to do for this next phase of my life? And I really mean it when I say I want to present to people new ideas and new experiences. And one of them definitely centers around art and the other is philanthropy. And this conversation gave me a chance to explore both. So thank you so much, Deb. Oh, wonderful. I, I'm really glad of that. And so glad to share uh, this with my listeners, because I'm sure that people will learn a lot from this conversation. Hopefully the, the people who are out um, on the West Coast and, and definitely in L.A. can can really start to take advantage of what uh, you shared and, and get to the events. Um, that are coming up and your, you know, event coming up uh, next week in particular, that'd be wonderful. So, um, yeah, thank you. Fun just yeah. to get the name out. We, I think we're almost sold out, but just oh, the great. idea of everybody hearing about it is exciting. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. You're so welcome. Um, so this is great. So, um, everyone, I'm sure that you enjoyed the show. Please make sure you share it on social media, share it with your friends. As I said, definitely, uh, consider leaving a review of the show. Let us know what you uh, thought and please visit Diane's website and uh, learn more about how you can uh, possibly start collecting or enjoying um, some art yourself. So once again, some Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. You can also join in the conversation on Facebook.com slash Women Entrepreneurs and on the website, WomenEntrepreneurSecrets.com. And don't forget to listen in on DVCoach.Podomatic.com and on iTunes.